said, no, it's two minutes after seven. So we're, we're going for it, all right? But uh, let's praise God to see you here this afternoon and we can come and worship together. And uh, everything that uh, the Lord has prospered with and what he has given us. But uh, just remember all the things that are going to go on this week. Some things have been scrolling here. And of course, uh, I know that we have had um, giving honor to Sister Rhonda for what she does here and everything. So if you haven't given, go ahead and put it in the pot. How about that? But uh, we just thank God for that. And also, uh, imagine this is for the young ladies. It's going to be at Revolution Church in Gastonia. So you can see uh, Stephanie about that okay, if you have any questions. And just remember, not quite a week away. Just make sure, as I said last Wednesday, make sure you vote, because if you don't, you have no reason to gripe, okay? But you know, it might not come out the way you want to, but at least you put your part in, all right? So just, just keep that in, in mind. And remember also that this Sunday morning, uh, time changes, okay? So you're going to fall back an hour. That means you get to sleep another hour. And I, I, I can't figure out this one. My body has got its own clock. I usually wake up somewhere between 4 and 5, so that means I'm going to wake up between 3 and 4, okay? So uh, it's going to be rough for a while, <laughs> but just remember to set your clock. If you don't, Pastor Joy might just go ahead and preach twice, okay? Uh, youth retreat, for more information, of course, see, see the youth leaders. I'm going to go, go on the catalyst, and of course, there's a schedule for the nursery. But uh, we just praise God that we're able to come tonight, and, and there's a lot going on, and we're going to go over the, the prayer list. But uh, more than anything else, I want you to pray for our nation. You know, whenever we think about it, and we think about the nation, we think about what it's going through and things are happening. And, um, and very honestly, it's not going to get better for a while. It's going to get worse. And, uh, and I'm saying worse than the fact that, uh, and of course, God led me to scripture tonight. We're going to go through it, and it's not talking about this nation. It's talking about the people of the nation. It's talking about us because we make up the nation. We make up the church. We make up God's people. And as we look at it and understand that a lot of things that has been revealed, more is to be revealed. And whenever you come and you look and say, you know, what can I do? How can I change my mind? What can I do? Well, just to let you know, North Carolina doesn't have that, but several states have the fact that if you voted early, you can change your mind and change your vote. But that goes out tomorrow. And uh, so there, there are all types of situations, people saying, you know, after you do these things, you're going to scratch your head and say, well, I wish I had a. That's why we need to pray and pray hard in every decision we make. And uh, just pray that God will lift up those who are running in for office and the only way that God can lift them up is that you lift them up in prayer and continue in that. Uh, on our prayer list today, we didn't want to continue to remember Johnny Mace. He is in serious condition. Continue to remember him. Also, Zach Davis. Uh, have not heard anything recently, but I know that he's still uh, situations and everything. The family needs a lot of prayer in this. Uh, Kim Dodgen uh, has much pain or has had. I haven't heard any update within the past hours. But uh, she was in the hospital and with kidney stones. And uh, so just keep that. Amber Finger, which is my granddaughter, uh, it, it gets hard sometimes whenever you got a granddaughter and she's about tall as I am. Of course, she's around 20, and I'm a little older than that. But whenever you come there and understand that she's been going through some things for quite a while with her stomach and issues and so that she had to have a blood test done yesterday, and she was running from one hospital to the other one doing things. But she's probably going to have to have a colonoscopy, also an, endo an endoscopy. I can't remember what. And then some other things going on and some CT scans, all this kind of thing, because there's something going on because just to smell food makes her sick and everything. So she's got a lot happening in her life. And I just tucked and put my arm around her, and I said, Amber, I said, the doctors can do a lot. I said, but let's give it to Dr. Jesus. And, you know, whenever we do that, and, you know, I'm talking because it's a granddaughter, okay? And uh, so here we just understand that God can do that. Also, Becky Dellinger, which is a sister-in-law, she's going to go for surgery tomorrow. She has something going on in her knee, and they think it's cancer in her knee. So just keep her also in your prayers. 
and I got a praise report that I gave last week. My wife said it was premature because uh, my sister-in-law, Ravina Dellinger, who has uh, part of her nose taken off and had cancer, well, the doctor saw her today, and uh, he proclaimed her cancer-free, and she's doing great, and we just give God the praise for that. And uh, so we just, you know, hang in there and believe God. Hazley Carpenter got to go home. That's another praise report. Uh, just keep that in fact. And D.G. Uh, D.J. Williams, pastor's dad, is going to have surgery on November 23rd. Also, Richard Stewart had two uh, seizures yesterday, so just keep him in prayer um, as they are going through this. Shirley Howell, pancreatic cancer, uh, just keep her in prayer. And, of course, I've already spoke about the elections here, early voting and everything that's happening. So just keep that in your prayers and um, just keep lifting up our nation. And, uh, and when I'm talking about nation, let me, let me go one step further. And I know we're getting close to Veterans Day. It's something to have grandchildren who are uh, in, the ser- in the service and the fact that you don't know where they're at. Uh, you don't know what position, what place. The last I heard about one of my grandsons was he was in the Mediterranean area. Don't know where, don't know what ship, don't know what place. And uh, so there's a lot of things that's going on that we don't know about. And But just keep all of our servicemen in your prayers, those who are serving now and those who have served. Just remember James Sherrill, Brenda's brother. Uh, he uh, has come out of CCU, and uh, so he's improving. Uh, Brenda's here tonight, so that means she's improving. And uh, we just praise God for that. She's able to come back, be with us. And... Uh, also for Aria Blanton, uh, surgery, they're going to put plugs in the ears and the surgery in that point. So just keep these uh, in your prayer. Do we have any other prayer request? Spoken or unspoken? Okay. All right. Let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, I thank you that you are enough for whatever situation we walk through. And Lord, when we come, we come trusting in you and Lord, just laying ourself, our life, our all before you. Because Father, even before the things and situations come in our life or the lives of these whom we have named, Lord. Lord, as we looked at these, as we have looked over the past weeks and maybe just this day, we know that you have the answer for whatever need that might be there. And we just ask you, Lord Jesus, that your hand might overshadow them lord god that you might comfort them that you might touch them and you bring healing into their bodies lord god but lord i know that the fact that we can come on their behalf and we can pray even for our daughter our granddaughter or for our friend or for our co-church member who might be here even among us tonight lord god for the things that they're going through and lord we know we're able to ask you but lord that it's you who brings forth the healing. It's you who brings forth the work that is needed, in, even in our lives, Lord God, individually. And Lord, we just surrender ourselves to you. For whatever work you need to do in us, Lord, we release that unto you that you can. And we ask you, Lord, to touch us and to heal us, and Lord God, to strengthen us in those places where we're weak. And Lord, it's not only the fact that sometimes that we're weak physically in our body, And maybe diseases have taken hold in some manner or another. Lord, you can overcome all these things. But Lord, I just thank you that you are the overcomer in our life. And you are the one who can bring us abilities that we've never had before and we've lost a long time ago. Father God, I just thank you, Lord, that here in this place tonight, Lord God, that even as your word is spoken, as your word is read, Lord God, may you be the minister. May you be the one who proclaims. May you be the one who carries out. May you be the one who heals. May you be the one who forgives. May you be the one who releases, even as we come before you. And Father, I just look for the release of your Holy Spirit in this place tonight and for every name that we have prayed over, Father God, that as you go into these rooms where they're at and these homes where they're at, Lord God, I ask that you carry forth, first of all, your healing power of salvation, Lord God, that you take it into that room where they're at. And even as they believe and call upon you, Lord God, I know that there will be healing that's going to come. Because, Lord God, if we who are sick does not trust in you, then there would be no healing. 
that we might trust you and might believe in you. And Father, we just ask that through everything that's done, everything that's said this night, that it might bring you glory, might bring you honor, and might bring, Father God, us closer to you. And Father, we just ask for the ministration of your Holy Spirit. Touch us, guide us, and direct us. For it's in your precious name, Christ, that we do pray. Amen. And if you have your Bibles tonight, <clears throat> it's going to be a little bit different turn, and I don't have any jars with water in it. <laughs> I don't have any salt to make the light come on. But we're going to be talking about some other things that's uh, real that will possibly enlighten us tonight. But we're going to go to Ephesians, the fifth chapter. Uh, it's primarily where we're going to be hanging out tonight for a while. And uh, if you will, let's stand as we read uh, verses 1 through 7 of Ephesians. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ hath also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us in offering and in sacrifice to God a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanliness or covetousness let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be, ye, be not ye therefore partakers with them. Father God, take this scripture, take your word. Lord, open our ears and our heart to receive that we might hear you speak in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. You know, whenever we look at <clears throat> the scripture... It relates to many things, and, and one of the things that we, we look at in, in these scriptures and the words that we have read, that first of all, it talks about the fact that you are to be the imitators of God. That first of all, you've got, if you are a child of God, if you're a Christian, and I, I'm using that word, if, two-letter word. <clears throat> if you go through the word of God and you look at it a lot in Paul's writings, if comes up a whole lot. That two-letter word, it says, if you are. If you are, if you are, because it's a lot of possibilities, just like Paul is relating here, the fact that he's writing to the church at Corinth, a church of people who say that they have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. They are followers of him. But in these things that Paul is bringing out, you would not think about it being in the body of Christ, but yet it was. You can go back and you can look not only in the, the writing to the church at Ephesus, but you can go back and look at it in the writing to the church of Corinth. You can look at it in other areas of the letters that churches had a problem. And the problem the church had was the fact that the world was in the church. The world was in the church, and the things that the world was doing, the church was doing. And this is why Paul is admonishing them in this Remember, a little bit later, he writes Timothy, and he tells Timothy, he said, you know, whenever you're preaching the gospel, preach it whether it's in season or out of season. No matter where it's at, preach the gospel. He said, don't get in disputes and genealogies and, and things such as that. This is where people try to get you over to the other side and tell you about things which are not those things or life-giving. But he said, preach it in season or out of season. And today, my friends, that these scriptures are not in season to our world today. They're not in season to people who are sitting in the church and our church pews around our community, around our state, around our country. Because it's referring to something that should be dead in our life. It's referring to something that should not be a part of us. And that's why when we, we come and we look at these scriptures, it is talking about the fact here that we have knowledge that in our life that we are a person who has changed because the Lord Jesus Christ cleansed us of all those things which are in our life. And I know I probably have mentioned it before, and I, I don't keep records, okay? You can't. But um, some years ago at a church, a young lady came. She was 14 years old, and she bowed down at the, at the altar, and she re received Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. 
and I was standing such as I am now, and of course then a whole lot younger, and, and I, I knelt down beside of her, and she looked up at me with tears in her eyes. She said, I have never felt so clean because God cleansed me. God forgave me. God took all those things, and, and you know, my mind went back through and said, how can this 14-year-old girl have so much in her, her life to be asked to, you know, to be forgiven in everything that happened? This has been some years ago, and I'm talking about way back 70s, okay? So some of you are not that old. All right, but whenever we look back on these times, it's the fact that God cleanses us. Then why does Paul have to come here, and he's talking to the church at Corinth about these things, and Paul is saying in verse 2, it says, Walk in love as Christ also loved us and given himself for us. We walk in love as an offering and a sacrifice to God, a sweet-smelling aroma or savor and that was out of the new king james so i slipped on you okay but uh, whenever we we look at this he's given himself for us and offering in sacrifice that we're going to be pleasing to god by our life and paul is relating here that that in these things we cannot be pleasing to god if these things are in our life because paul said in verse three he said but here fornication and all uncleanliness our covetousness, let it not even be named among you as become a saints. Don't even let it be thought of. Don't let it be a part of your life. Don't let it be in there because these things are not to be in our life. When you go on to verse 4, it says, Neither filthiness, <clears throat> nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. Now, when we come back and we look at some of these verses and some of these things that are in here, it talks about the fact, of course, we can understand uh, fornication, uh, sexual uh, uncleanliness, covetousness. When you covet and you desire things, you're, you're wanting to build. I think we touched on that last week, that you're wanting to build your kingdom instead of God's kingdom. You're wanting things. It says that these things should not even be talked about among you. And, and whenever we come and, and understand here it says it's not fitting among the saints, neither filthiness. What happens in the break room? What happens in the break room? How about foolish talking? How about jesting? How about all these things? And you, you say, well, well, Jim, can I have a good time? Can I, can I joke and kid around? Guess what it does? First of all, somebody looking at you as a child of God is going to start asking a question. Is he real or not? Because we can't take up the talk. We can't take up those things and the lifestyles of, of people who are unsaved. And we cannot take that because if they ever need you, they're not going to look to you. Why? Because you're the same thing they are. They're not going to find you and look to you in, in a time when they're hurting and they need somebody to come along and to guide them. Why? Because you're the same as they are. In verse 5, it says that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of God. In other words, Paul is relating the fact that here in the midst of this, that we come and we, we think about these things that's happening in our life and the great big thing in fact is this. You have no inheritance if you're one of these. You're not a part of the kingdom of God if this is in your life and this is your lifestyle and this is what you do and this is what you think and this is what you say. When we come down to verse 6, Let no man deceive you with vain words. And you say, well, Jim, what is vain words today? Vain words today, and it happens from the podium in churches. It happens as people go in and out of churches. And there are pastors who will stand there 
And I got to pick on Tony. Okay, he, he's 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 the bull's eye over here. All right, he's 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 written in red here. Tony comes out the door, and, and he has got stuff in his life. He's got stuff that's not right. He's got stuff that is wrong. He's carrying baggage. And he comes by the pastor. Pastor pats him on the back and said, Tony, brother Tony, you're doing great today, aren't you? Just keep it up. God bless you. What's he feel like? Well, I'm sinning and doing everything in the world that's contrary to the word of God, but the preacher says I'm doing great. There's nothing wrong in my life. You see, the vain words of the fact that the world will tell you everything that you're doing in the part of the world, it's okay because everybody else is doing it. It's a decision they've done and the things that they have. But whenever God looks at our life, it's, it's a little different story. Because here in verse 6, it's letting us know that don't let deception come in because these things come out of these things come the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Uh, did you catch Paul's writing? Children. He's still saying that you're a child, but you're a disobedient child. He's saying that, still saying that, that God's love is toward you, but you're disobedient and you're, you're not in the, the place that you should be. But when we go on to verse 7, it jumps out at us real good. You know, it says, Be not ye therefore partakers with them. In other words, it means don't keep company with them. If a person who is like that, and guess who he's talking about? He's talking about the church. He's talking about the church, and if there are any individuals in the church that have this lifestyle and doing these things, first of all, you need to pray for them. Second of all, you need to stay away from them in the fact of letting their lifestyle flow onto you and you take up that lifestyle. Whenever you go back to Jude, and I didn't do this, I'm just hitting it real quick. One of the things it says in Jude, go into place to snatch those out to bring them out, even hating the, the soil on their vesture, even hating the place where they're at, even hating the things that they do. You know, I love every person, but I hate to sin. I love my grandchildren, but I hate to sin that they find themselves in. And today that we do not have a relationship or a good relationship with one of our sons and his family, and especially my granddaughter. Why? Because, uh, and I'm taking my watch off so I know where I'm at, okay? Unless Sister Trace is going to flag me down. Whenever we, we're looking at these things, I made a commitment to the Lord. And when you come back and look at it, and I don't know whether I've said it or shared it before, it may have, my granddaughter was going to get married. I talked to her and, my, and the husband-to-be. Or before that marriage, and it was going to happen in the church and everything, well, somehow or another, it possessed them to get a trailer and started living together prior to their marriage. And I declined to marry them. Because I cannot come and stand at God's altar and say that everything's okay. I cannot proclaim that God is in the midst of this and God is putting this couple together as they are in the sin where they are. I can't do it. I had another grandchild, a young man. You never know, even though he has been in church and <clears throat> everything, sometimes you just don't know. You think everything is great. And then you come through and you sit with he and the wife-to-be and they make the proclamation two months, everything's going to be fine and, and marriage is going to happen and everything. And there again, before marriage, things were happening. Things didn't pan out the way they said it was going to do. They didn't live where they said that we were going to live. We made it to the wedding. I did not do the wedding. And you know, I can only feel the sense of the pastor who stood there and he proclaimed because the young lady went to his church how great a Christian they were and a child of God they were. Everything was fine. The vows were taken. We drove five miles to another church and went into reception for the wedding. Everything went great, and then 
You ever heard about him then? This young man's mother-in-law quickly became that day. She could not wait until she proclaimed from the back of the fellowship hall, Hey, everybody, we're expecting. That pastor, if he could have found a hole to have crawled in, he would have. Because it demolished him. You see, you never know what you're going to find in church. You never know what you're going to find in your family. Because they can come and understand that you have taken them to church and you have supported them in their life and done different things in their life, but you never know what's really there. But God reveals it. God allows it to come and God allows it to to be revealed in these things. And I know there are a lot of people today that can look and say, well, you know, I don't need the preacher, I don't need the church, I don't need somebody to tell me how to worship or what to do because I can worship God wherever I'm at. I can go out here on the, on the backside and sit in my swing in the woods and I can worship God. Yes, you can. Let's just look at Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. Ephesians 11 says, and he gave some prophets and some uh, Apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, and some teachers and pastors. For the perfecting of the saints, and for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come into the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature and the fullness of Christ. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine and by the slight of men and the cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up unto him in all things which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh the increase of the body unto the edifying itself in love. Why do we need a pastor? A pastor comes. Pastor Joy, whenever he stands in this position, he is he's standing here and he's proclaiming the word of God. He's proclaiming what God says. He's proclaiming that and he is not only proclaiming the word and teaching you the word, but he is also doing something else. He is looking at you as a spiritual leader, and he is to look at you in your faults and in your accomplishments and in the things of your life. He is to be a guidance in your life. That's what pastors are for. You're there because in this time there are people who are tossed to and fro and by every wind of doctrine, by everything. What do they believe and who do they believe? What happens when you come here and understand? Because the trickery of men, because the deceitfulness and the things that are happening. And, you know, whenever we come and look at it, you know, say, wow, you know, in the church? Yes, in the church. Do you realize that today that there is basically no difference between the world outside and the church inside, as far as divorce and far as things happening in our families, there's very little difference in it. Why? Because it's exactly what Paul is doing. There is the fact that there is sin in the church and there are sinners in the church and there are people who need to have their lives cleansed in the church because God is willing and able to do that. But you see, the Lord said here, even as Paul was writing, first of all, you've got to walk in love. You're not to cast out a person who's in the midst of this, but you're to come to the side of them and you're to love them, you're to guide them, you're to direct them through these things and understand that. But, you know, who can come before God? Who can come and stand before God and know that you are right before him? In Psalms 24, verses 1 through 6, It says, uh, this is a psalm of David, and said, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. He hath founded upon the seas and established upon the floods. 
Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands, and hath a pure heart, and hath not lifted up his soul into vanity, or sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord, and righteousness from God, the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob, Shelah. When I started out um, on this, I'm going to say, venture as God set us for tonight, I stopped Kelsey out in the hallway Sunday, and I asked her a question. Whenever you come and you see this word in Psalms, Shelah, what does it really mean? Well, you, you, you can go back and you can look, and it says, well, there is a place of meditation. It's a place to meditate. I've seen others where it says, well, this is a, a, a word that says, think about it. It's another in, in the musical part. It says this is a musical note. It's a pause. And whenever you look at it in Psalms, it's written, and this is where you'll find it the majority of the time, Selah, that you come there and it means take a rest. Think about what you just said. Think about what you just read. And it's very fitting that it comes here after verse 6. Think about it. Think about what God said. Who's going to stand before him? Those who have clean hands and a pure heart. Those who are able to stand before him. That they've not lifted their soul up to have an idol. They have not sworn deceitfully. They have not been in the midst, basically, of what Paul is relating here to the church in Ephesus. So when we look at these things, understand that he is calling us out not to be like the world, but that we got to be different. We go back to Ephesians, the fifth chapter, starting with the eight verse through eight through fourteen, and it says here that for ye were sometimes darkness sometimes but not any longer you were in this place you were these things but now you're 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 the light of the lord walk as children of the light for the fruit of the spirit is in all goodness righteousness and truth that's what the spirit is saying proving what is acceptable unto the lord and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of the darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. And whatsoever doth make manifest is light. And wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. You know, I, I can almost see this in the fact that uh, here that Paul is relating the fact that, you know, just come on, you know, somebody's sleeping, just get a hold of them and shake them real good. Shake them good. Why? To wake them up. And the thing that we're here in his awakening message here is the fact that we need to be awakened to the fact that what, what did the scripture relate to? It says these things that we have here, he says, one time you were in darkness, one time you walked in darkness, but you're not in darkness any longer because you have seen the light. The light came through Christ. You're not walking in that darkness any longer because he has given you a light. He has forgiven you of your sins. He has cleansed you. Why do you want to go back like a pig and jump in the mud hole again? <laughs> Sorry to put it that way. All right. Why do we want to get dirty again? Why do we want to get muddy again after we have already been cleansed? Why do we want to go back to those places? But he says the fruit of the Spirit is goodness, righteousness, and truth. But here, in verse 10, it says, finding out, <laughs> finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. I believe there's a lot of times, and I've talked about some family, and I've talked about friends, and, and I'll talk about a neighbor who's gone on to be and to meet her maker. 
and years ago that she would really have a situation sometimes of, of, a, of a real on fire revivalist came into town and the one that came out of Virginia that came to our city and one of the things about it was the fact that uh, we, we put up a tent and we had sawdust on the ground and all this kind of good thing but you know what he preached about he preached about sin he preached about hell and her comment was the fact that and she is a church going believer God would not send anybody to hell God would not do that No, God doesn't. We do. God loves us and God cares for us. God wants to, to bring forth the light of himself through us that the world around us can see the light. But he loves his children. And he wants his children to be able to come and to bring fellowship to other people through him. But when we come down to verse 11, it says, Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Reprove them. You know, when we look, and I was talking about grandchildren, maybe you have some grandchildren. A lot of us do. It says, have no fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. How, how do we do in reproving our grandchildren or those who are close to us or those in our family? Reprove means to expose. That when we look at somebody and tell them whether they're in our family or whether they're somebody next door or whatever, and we say, I don't want to break up the relationship that we have. I don't want them to feel bad toward me. I don't want to do this or I don't do that. So I'm not going to tell them about the Lord. I'm not going to tell them that what they're doing is not going to lead to everlasting life, but is going to lead to destruction. So I'm not going to tell them I don't want to break that relationship. There are people in the workplace you see happening all around you, those things of, uh, of sexual uncleanliness and everything else that's going on it's the fact that you see it but you're afraid that you're going to stand out so you don't say anything about it you're afraid that somebody's going to look at you and take think the wrong thing because you are a, a goody no the scripture here says that we will expose those things which are wrong how can we expose it because of the rightness in our life because if we go a little bit further, the very next verse, verse 12. Paul says, it's a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in the secret. When you're talking about the things and what they did over the weekend or what they did and how they expressed their things in their life and, and those things which are contrary to God's word, and you stand around the, uh, you know, it's all proverbial words, stand around the water fountain and you talk about these things in your life and you agree. The Word of God says, it's a shame even to speak of it. It's a shame even to recognize it. Because whenever you're doing these things, you're not recognizing the one who gave his life for you and who has given this life for them. You're not even to speak of those things that are done in secret. You're not to talk about them. But verse 13 says, but you are to expose it. You're to expose it by the lights in your life. You're to expose it and make it manifest out of your life. Whenever we look at our situation in the, in the world today, look at the things that are happening and we talk about our nation, we talk about the reality of how it's going to change us or do things in our life. Let's go back to Psalms 9, verses 15 through 20. David prayed many prayers, and one of the prayers that he prayed was the fact that he prayed for those who were coming against him and those who were bringing uh, actually hatred and, and battle against him. 
And I found a good place right here for a promotional speech. How about that? It's not political. North Carolina is a battleground state. North Carolina is in a battle. Church, you're sitting in North Carolina. There's a battle that's going on even within our walls. There's a battle going on even with our county. There's a battle going on wherever we walk and where we're doing. There's a battle between evil and good. There's a battle that's happening. Where's your flag? There's one flag that says darkness. There's another that says light. Are we walking under the flag that is going to bring light? Or are we walking under one that's going to bring only darkness? In verse 15 of Psalms 9, it says, The heathen are sunk down into, it, into the pit that they made. In the net which they hid is their own foot taken. They're caught in it. Verse 16 says, The Lord is known by the judgment which he executeth. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. Selah. This other good little word, hikigon, means meditate. Think about it. The wicked has snare, is caught in his own snare. Something he's made with his own hands, he's caught. He's caught. Verse 17. It says, And the wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forgot God, that forget God. For the needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. Arise, O Lord. Let not man prevail. Let the heathen be judged in thy sight. Verse 20 says, Put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know that themselves to be but men. See long. We're men. We're men. We're women. We're men and we're women and we make decisions and we run for offices and we lead people and we teach people and we do certain things in our life. But God's the judge. God is the judge of our life, my life, your life. God is the judge of all. And he asks us, very primarily here in this last section in chapter 5 of Ephesians in verse 15. It says here, see then that you walk circumspectively. That means carefully. Walk circumspectively, not as fools, but as wise. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Pastor Roger used this Sunday. Therefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart unto the Lord, and giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves to one another in the fear of God, in this last section of this chapter, there's something that, that he's relating to and wanting us to understand and the fact that whenever we come and we walk carefully in this world, we walk circumspectively, not as fools, but as the wise, we come and we walk that people can see and understand who we are. It also says that we are to redeem the time. In other words, we're to take notice of the time that God has given us that we might be able to, to make a change in somebody's life because of out of the witness that we have in our life. It's saying, listen and look and be that witness, be that one, redeem the time, take, take notice of what time you have in this time. 
verse 17 talks about the fact here that, that as we are to do these things, that we are need to understand what the will of the Lord is. What's his will? It's bringing out a lot of different things maybe that you've never uh, thought about. What is his will? What's his will in my life? What's his desire in my life? Well, one of the things that we, we go through and we find out is the fact that one of the things he tells us, uh, you know, that we're not we're to understand, it says not to be drunk with wine. We're in his excess. When you're drunk with wine, one of the things about it, your, your eyes are clouded, you can't see well, your steps are, are staggering, you can't walk well. There are things that happens because it, you're not controlling yourself, the wine's controlling you. But it says here, but be filled with the Spirit. And you say, well, I, I'm filled with the Spirit. I was back in 1970, what? 1960, what? I'm, I'm getting the old folks first. How about that? Just a few years ago, just last week. It is not talking about being filled with the presence of God. It is not talking about that experience that happened to you years ago if you look it up and you go back and you look at the greek this field means continual filling it means it happens over and over and over and over again whenever you buy your car the gas that it, it, you drove it away from the dealership in you had to fill it up again it runs out because if the Holy Spirit is, you are being used of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is in you, then that power and that ability, you have to keep being filled that you will have power and ability to do what God has called you to do. Because we get weak in our flesh, we get weak in the things of our life and the things that were happening. We have to be filled and filled again by the Holy Spirit. A continual filling, that's what it means. A continual filling of the Holy Spirit in our life. That we can do his work. That's the only way that we can. But here it's talking about the very fact that as we do these things and we come to a place that we can uh, hear, that we can speak to each other in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing, making melody. And one of the things that we, we come sometimes and understand I don't have the joy that I once had. Back in Psalms 51, that's one of the things that David prayed for, the fact that, that Lord God, need to restore the joy of my salvation. Because the way I felt in those first days of my experience with you, Lord, I was full and I was joyful and, and I was on top of the world. But something's happened. I had a lady tell me one time and said she felt like a plug was pulled out of her foot and everything just drained out. So I don't know if that happens or not, okay? But that, that's what she told me. She said, that's how I feel. I feel like everything in me is drained out. But we come back and understand that God wants us to be full of joy. Not of what we do, but what he does. It's joyful. Let's go for just for a moment and don't have it. Just two more spots to stop. How about that, guys? First Thessalonians 4, 3 through 8. What is the will of the Lord? For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. Okay, that, this, that part, that's where we're at. This is the will of God, even your sanctification. To be sanctified. What's sanctified? It means separated. You have been separated for a purpose. You have been sanctified and you've been brought forth. You have been cleansed. And now you are there for a purpose. The second part of that verse says that ye should abstain from fornication. That's a part of that sanctification that's going to happen in your life. That you are to abstain from, in our new English language, that we say that we're not to have any sexual immorality in our life. Speech or action. Okay? That's real simple. How about that? Verse 4 says that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. 
I'm giving Sister Janet a problem back here. I keep moving around. I love her. Anyway, whenever we do these things, it says that everyone should know how to possess his vessel. Now, when we look here in, in these scriptures in Thessalonians to the Thessalonican church, do you know how to possess your vessel? Do you know how to take care of your vessel? And you say, well, you know, we think about a vessel, we think about something we can put something in, you know. Uh, we, we think about something we can pour milk in or tea in, or we think about something we can put water in and carry it. We think about a vessel that we can put something in and handle it. The vessel he's talking about is my body and your body. Our bodies. Do you know how you are to possess your vessel, control your vessel? I know that in the years of our life that we have gone through many things, these 54 years of our marriage. There have been high points and low points and points. And I know there were times in my life where there were things that were in my life that shouldn't have been there, and yet I was a professing child of God, and I was teaching Sunday school to youth, and I was seeing all these different things that were happening. And I could see what was happening in other people's lives. And there were times that I was not where I needed to be, that I had walked away from God. And I suppose just in the, in the same place, I saw teenagers all around me because we were in the youth ministry, if you want to call it that, because they were the youth and they were at our house about 25 or 30 about all the time. Had a young man that came and he just started driving and he had a new girlfriend. Heard about her, never seen her before, beautiful young lady. And of course around in our living area we were wall to wall and on the floor and everything else, kids sitting around talking. And one of the things that was being expounded was the fact that they, some of them were giving their testimony of what the Lord had done in their life and giving a testimony and, and asking God to forgive them of their sins. And this one young man whom I know that God had been dealing with as a call in the ministry years ago. I'm talking about years ago. Hey, we're going back to the 70s again, okay? He got up and he stood there and he made a comment. And he pointed to his girlfriend. And he said that she had allowed him to have a relationship with her and pointed her out that she was at fault. At that moment, she broke down and started crying. I took her home, which was down Reitsville Road, a very well-known person. Her family was. Her weeping and sobbing all the way, broken. Because she was fulfilling a desire that somebody that, who said that they were a child of God desired to be fulfilled. But now she's broken. She's broken and she don't want to hear any more about church and she don't want to hear anything else about the Lord. Because she was in the midst of the Lord's and she becomes scarred because of it. Something that she would have to carry. Another young man in that group, along with his sister, had parents who were well-known in our neighborhoods. And occasionally they had social drink, and they went to parties, and they went to things with other people their age. Of course, the kids were in their teens. And they had their cabinet where they had their alcohol in, and it was locked. But while the parents were gone on a, on a vacation by themselves and another group, the teenagers were left at home and this young man knew where the key was at. This young man went to the cabinet 
and partook of that which was within the cabinet, and then he drove to Boger City and all the way back home. The influence overcame him. And that car found a power pole. And in that place he died. You see, there was a decision. And that young mother, and I'm saying young mother, that she came and day after day, week after week, she was in a cemetery where he was placed weeping at the tombstone. Where? Because it came back to her. You see, there's a lot of things that happens in our lives because people look at us, our children look at us, everything that is happening, we are seen. While I was in East Coast Bible College, the professors were talking about, and of course the professors have been here before, <laughs> Brother Gilly and Sammy Oxendine, they were my teachers, how about that? That's a little while ago. And they were talking about that the corral had left from East Coast Bible College and they had gone up to Cleveland, Tennessee, ministering in a church. Talked about a family that they had seen and had been involved with. They were there for several days in revival. And they came there and, and one of the things that they saw in this family, there was the husband and the wife and a daughter and a son. And as they were there and, and God was working among them and with them and the invitation was given this one night. It was almost the last night before they were going to leave and come back to North Carolina. As they were there, the invitation was given. The daughter was beside her mom. The son was beside the dad. And the daughter reached over, and I'm telling you what the corral saw because they were looking from the front to the back. Saw the daughter reach over and touched the mama's hand. Their eyes met, and the mother walked with the daughter to front, and she gave her heart to Jesus Christ. At this same time, the Holy Spirit was dealing with the son. The son looked at his dad. His dad was there with his hands clamped on the back of that pew, hanging on, because he was feeling conviction, but he didn't go. His son was feeling conviction, and he didn't go. As the corral was getting their equipment back together, there was a siren that they heard in an ambulance. And one mile down the road from that church, this young 16-year-old in a Mustang had a wreck, and in that place he died without Jesus. Why don't you tell me this, Jim? Because your children are looking at you. Your children are looking for someone to lead them and to bring them to that place. Is our vessel in such an order that they can understand and they can look at our life and they can know that we're a child of God? Do we speak out of our lips that they will know whom we trust and whom we believe? Do we come to that place? And I'm just going to ask you this kind of point blank, Okay. There's a lot of things that's hidden in our life. Some of these things that we've talked about tonight, we're talking about sexual sins and talking about certain things that as here as Paul has related, that these things are not to dwell in those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's not to be an unclean person. There's not to be the fornicator. There's not to be uh, any idolater or covetous person who's, who's, who's made money, their idol and things. He said all these things, it's, it's not fitting that's what Paul's writing. It's not fitting. But you know, in most of our churches, in fact, and in our lives, there were things that happened in our life that was not fitting. But it was a secret. It was something you didn't talk about, something you didn't want anybody to know about. It was something that you hid. But you came in the church doors every Sunday morning. Each time we came, but we brought it with us but never turn loose of it. And I'm just asking you a question real quickly. No matter 
how committed? Sin will be exposed. It doesn't matter how that sin has been committed. There's a day this is going to come forth. Luke 12, 2 says, For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, and nothing hid that shall not be known. Everything that is in our life is going to come out. It's going to come out. It comes when you don't think about it. It comes from the fact that in, in, in back in the 90s, there were things in my life that was not right. And me and this sweet lady stood before, and I know I've told you this, and we, we stood before and we were again renewed our marriage vows and, and asked God to take care of all those things we're back under, to remove them, to forgive them, to cleanse them, that we started off anew again. But you know, something was happening because there was a relationship that should not have been happening. And I'm saying a relationship, a work relationship with someone and too close and all that kind of situation. 23 years ago. And I'm going to tell my wife something she don't know. How about that? Our daughter gave us a tablet for Christmas two years ago. And there was a message that came across that tablet from somebody 23 years ago. The message said, glad to see you're okay. I'll never forget you. But for the sake of the families, goodbye. Whenever we come and we look at our life, I don't know where this person lives, don't know where they're at, or nothing else, but on Facebook, you can be found. For the sake of our families, goodbye. We never know where our sins will be revealed. We never know when it's coming. The question is, do you have a secret sin in your life tonight? Like the sin of Cain, it may be done in secret. Like the sin of Esau, it may be done without the impulse, just under an impulse of that moment. Like the sin of Joseph's brethren, uh, it was years before it was ever found out, never discovered. Like the sin of Achan, it may be well covered up. Like the sin of Samson, it may be done reluctantly. Like the sin of Ahab, it may be prompted by others. Like the sin of Belshazzar, it may be done under the influence of strong drink. Like the sin of Herod, it may be the result of a foolish promise that's been given. Like the sin of Judas, it may be, it may have approval of the authorities. Like the sin of Pilate, it may be done to gratify the public. Like the sin of the Jews, it may be done because of ignorance, just not knowing. God has called us to present ourselves in Romans 12, 1 and 2. It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's what I want you. And one of the things that happens is somewhere back through here that stuff's in our life and stuff keeps on coming up and stuff's there to keep us from doing what we need to do that we cannot come and we cannot give ourselves and we cannot turn our things loose. He wants us to come and present ourselves, our bodies, our life as a sacrifice before him. It's got to be undefiled. Some years ago, whenever what I was speaking of, some 23 years ago, 20 years ago, 22 years ago, I'll, I'll get my dates right in a minute. 
we came to that point when we met at the altar and we took off the old rings and put on new rings. And in the midst of this, there was a song that my wife sung. And there was a song that we hang on to. And I just want to read the words of it. And this, this is going to be our conclusion. This is going to be the fact here that I want you to understand that there is possibly a secret place in your heart, a secret place in your life where something's hidden. And God don't want it to be hidden. God wants it exposed. Because unless it's exposed, it cannot be done away with. It cannot be forgiven. It cannot be cleansed. But it's for us. Just open your ears to hear as I read this. I'm not going to sing it. Hallelujah. Okay. Said, my heart is like a house. One day I'll let the Savior in. And there are many rooms where we would visit now and then. But one day he saw that door. I knew the day had come too soon. I said, Jesus, I'm not ready for us to visit in that room. Because that's the place in my heart where I don't go. And I have some things hidden there that I don't want no one to know. But he handed me the keys with tears of love on his face. And he said, I want to make you clean. Let me go into your secret place. So I opened the door. The two of us walked in. I was so ashamed. His light revealed my hidden sin. But when I think about that room now, I'm not afraid anymore. Because I know my hidden sin no longer hides behind that door. That was a place in my heart where I, where even I wouldn't go. I had some things hidden there. I didn't want no one to know. But he handed me the keys with tears of love on his face. He made me clean. I let him in my secret place. Is there a place in your heart? Or even you won't go. Is there a place in your heart, a, a closet in your life that you're afraid one day they'll be opened? The secret place. Let me say you very truly, sincerely. Only if you open the door. Only if you open your door. Can Christ cleanse you of what's hidden there? Only when you open the door. Otherwise, it will abide with you forever. And it will cause darkness in your life. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you, Father, for the words that, by the Holy Spirit that you have spoken. Lord God, because this night I was compelled not to speak my words, but your words. Father God, because it is you who are speaking, it's you who are caring for these things, Lord God. That in each and every day of our life that we might know that it is you who has to come into those secret places of our life. It is you who has to clean and will clean as we make ourselves available for you to cleanse us. And Father, as we meditate upon these things, as we think about these things which have been said tonight and the scripture has been read, Lord God, that the secrets of our heart will not be a secret any longer before you because we'll ask you to cleanse us and forgive us of those things. And Father, as we get ready to depart from this place, Lord, let us remember that you're always available. You always have an ear that's open to hear. Father, forgive me. Father, cleanse me. Father, make me. May that be our request tonight in our life and in our heart. And Lord, I know you're able to do that which we ask you to do. Comfort us, Lord, by your Holy Spirit. 
and guide us, Lord God, that we can always look to you and understand that it's all because of you that we have the life that we have in you. We thank you for your sacrifice and for your love. For it's in the name of Jesus Christ we do offer this prayer. Amen. It's over, but we're still going to talk about that. <laughs>